Okay, let's continue on now and we'll move into 3B, which is all about unit conversion, but we need to understand how scientific notation works before we get there. Okay, so the only thing I know about scientific notation is I know it's going to be some number times 10 to some power. So both of these I can just start off with 10 to some power. Okay. Now the other thing I know is that um, I can only have one digit to the left, so I need for my decimal to be right there. So it's going to be 1.27 times something. And my decimal is here, so I'm going to move it over to here. This is a small number. This is just a little bitty, teeny tiny, tiny number, which means I'm going to have a negative exponent. And now I just have to count how many places I move this, and it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it ends up as 1.27 times 10 to the negative 8. In my next one here, I know that my decimal has to be right here. So I know I'm going to have 7.306 times 10 to some number. This is a great big number. My decimal is originally here. I need to move it to here. So I just count the places, 3, 6, 9. So this is a positive 9. Now we need to be able to go backwards. We need to be able to go from scientific notation to a number. So I know I'm initially going to start with, and I always use it right in the middle of the space because I, until I figure out, whoops, and you can't see that, I'm sorry, until I figure out where I'm supposed to go. So I know I've got a 377 somewhere in here. This is a big number, which means I'm going to be moving the decimal to the right. So it's going from here, and I'm moving it one, two, three, four, five places, and then fill in with zeros, which means it just cleaned up and pretty is 377,000. Okay. So since this is positive, it goes to the right. So since this is negative, it's going to go to the left. So I'm going to go ahead and do my 907 over here. So I'm going to have to take my decimal from right here and move it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 places to the left. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 zeros. And I always put a zero in front of the decimal. So again, just to make it pretty, 0 0.12345 zeros and then a 907. Okay. All right, to perform the operations, <clears throat> if you're multiplying, you can just go for it and put the parentheses. So just make a note on here to remember the parentheses. And if you do this in your calculator, it depends on what mode you're in. If you put this in your calculator, you're going to end up with 54,000 if it's in number mode. If it is not in scientific notation, it would be 5.4 times 10 to the fourth. So on the test, be sure and look at the instructions if it says put it in a, as a number or put it in scientific notation, you can do it either, you know, follow the instructions. If it doesn't say, it, I don't care. Okay. This is the one that we really need to pay attention to because this is the one that we're going to need for our energy conversions. The important thing here is the parentheses. Your calculator knows order of operations. So you must use those parentheses. So really what you're going to enter in your calculator is open parentheses 3.1 times 10 to the third, close your parentheses, divided by 4.5 times 10 to the negative 2, and close your parentheses. Now if you do that and you're in number mode, then you're going to end up 
with 68,888.9 is actually 0.8 repeating. If you are in scientific notation mode, what it will probably give you is 6.9 times 10 to the fourth. And again, if, if it gives you either one of those, that's fine. Not a problem. Okay. All right, now why are we doing all this? Because we want to be able to solve these energy conversion problems. All right, so when I read the problem, I'm going identi to identify some things as I go. Okay. All right, so how many liters of oil? How many liters of oil? That's what it wants to know, so that is going to be my end. So I know my answer over here is going to be liters of oil. That is also going to be my final conversion. I'm going to do liters of oil divided by its equivalence in joules. Now, where am I going to start for my starting units? It is not going to be in joules. It is going to be like a time unit. Okay. So it says in here, um, do you need to burn to provide the energy used by the average American home for a month? Those are my beginning units. This is where I start. So I'm going to have one month divided by one. Okay. Okay, now I've got this weird notation in here. It says assume there are 30 days in a month. So that's going to come in handy somewhere. Okay, so I'm going to just go ahead and take this and convert the month two days. I have to put the month down here so these units will cancel and it says that there are 30 days in a month. Okay. All right, well now I'm going to go to the energy, and what the energy tells me from here is the energy used by an average American home. So when I look at that on my chart, whoops, and I've got this all folded up. What I see here is that the energy use for an average home daily. Okay, well that now I know why I had to convert the month to days. I could have also just found it for a day and then multiplied it by 30 at the end. Okay, all right, so I know what my conversion factor is for this. So going from days to joules. So I know that my days is going to be on the bottom and my joules is going to be on the top. So I have one day is the equivalent of 5 times 10 to the 7th joules. Okay, so I got rid of the days. Now I have to get rid of the joules. So I have to find the one for a liter of oil and what its equivalence is in joules. So I know one liter of oil is equivalent to 1.2 whoops, times 10 to the seventh joules. And that gets rid of my joules. So I'm only left with liters of oil. So I've accomplished everything. So now I'm going to go from joules 
to liters of oil. Okay, so now it's all down to the calculator. So what do I have left in the numerator? And I didn't leave myself enough room here. So this is 30 times 5 times 10 to the 7th, all divided by 1.2 times 10 to the 7th. And if you do that multiplication, you end up with 125 liters of oil. Okay, find the rate of inflation between 2003 and 2019. Okay, the rate of inflation, how do I find that? This is the relative change using CPIs. Okay. Now, if we want to find the inflation between 2003 and 2019, our reference value is going to be 2019, and our compared value is our starting, which is 2003. So I'm going to do compared value minus reference value divided by reference value. Oops, and I just did this backwards. This is my compared value because we're comparing it, and this is my reference value. I think I said that and wrote it wrong. Okay, so now I have to look these up on the table. So 2019, the CPI is 255.7. In 2003, it's 184. And my reference value is 184. So that gives me 0 0.39 or 39%. Okay. <coughs> in 2000, a particular TV cost 300. What would be its equivalent cost in 2020? Okay, this is going to be my cost due to inflation. Okay, and that is going to be the price in, and this is going to be my reference, oops, I'm sorry, my compared, and this is my reference. So the price in 2020 is going to be the price in 2000 times the CPI in 2020 divided by the CPI in 2000. Okay. So the price in 2000 is $300. I'm going to put that over one. The CPI in 2020 is 258.8 and in 2000 it is 172.2. which gives me the equivalent cost of $450.87. Okay. Okay, so let's see what it says here. In 2010, a teacher's salary was 35,000. In 2017, the same teacher earned 41,000. Did the teacher's earnings keep up with inflation? Okay. All right. Well, let's see what this means. If it, if it, we're going to have to find the relative change. So I'm going to go back to my relative change formula. And I'm going to do it twice. I'm going to have to do it for the teacher salary. And I'm going to have to do the rate of inflation.
And what's going to happen here is if the percent change for the teacher's salary is less than the rate of inflation, they're losing money. If they're the same, in essence, they didn't have a raise for those seven years. And if it's more, then they actually are making a little bit more money. Okay. So let's see. We're going to be comparing. This is the compared value, and this is going to be the reference value. So for the teacher is going to be 41,000 minus 35,000 divided by 35,000. That turns out to be 0 0.171 or 17.1%. So their salary did go up, but let's see how it was compared to inflation. So 2017 is going to be my compared year. 2010 is going to be my reference year, and I'm going to use the CPIs for, the, for those years. So 2017 is 245.1, 2010 is 218.1, divided by the reference of 218.1, that gives me 0 0.124, which is 12.4%. So yes, it did keep up with inflation. So they, in essence, got less than a 5% raise over, you know, in terms of spending power. OK, this last one, I cannot emphasize enough the need for labeling things. So uh, let me get all, all my pens because I think I need every single one of them for this. I know I need this one. But we're going to go through, and this is a test to determine if someone has lupus. So they were checking to see how accurate the test was. And so they gave it to some people who have lupus and some people who don't have lupus. And then they compared to see, well, how many of the tests gave accurate results. Okay, so the things that I want us to remember on here is that if you have lupus and you test positive, this is a true positive. If you do not have lupus but you test positive, this is a false positive. If you have lupus and test negative, this is a false negative. If you do not have lupus and you test negative, then that's a true response. So this is a true negative. Now, looking at that, what you can tell here is that on this diagonal, These are accurate. On this diagonal, these are inaccurate. Now, the other thing that I do on here is I always label what the totals mean. Okay. All right. So this row here, this is the total who tests positive. This row here is the total that tests negative, whether they have the disease or not. This is the testing. Then the columns are split into the people who actually have lupus and the people who do not have lupus. So this is going to be the total lupus. And then this is going to be the total not lupus. Then this total here is the total participants.
how many people were tested. Okay. Now each of these questions is going to ask you for a percent. So what percent means I'm just going to find a fraction. Okay. These are the three that start out with what percent. Okay. What percent of those who test positive that is your denominator. The people who tested positive, there are 95 of those. So your numerator has to be one of these two numbers. How many out of these either have lupus or don't have lupus? And it asks how many have lupus. So out of this row, the have lupus, there are 90 of those. And then if you do the division, this becomes 0 0.947 or 94.7%. Okay. okay. What percent of those who do not have lupus There are 205 who do not have lupus. So the numerator has to be one of these two. And they want to know how many of those test positive. And that is going to be five. Okay. So five out of 205 is 0 0.024 or 2.4%. Okay. What percent of those tested? That's going to be the total of those tested. Have lupus and tested negative. Okay, so if it's out of the total, it could be any of these. It could be any of these numbers. So it's they have to have lupus and test negative. So they have to have lupus and test negative. So there are 10 of those. So that's 0 0.033 or 3.3%. So how accurate is the test? So we want to know the accuracy or what percent of those tested. Okay, so we're going to have another percent of those, of those tested. We know that's the total participants got an accurate result. So that are the true positive and the true negative. So that's going to be 90 plus 200. So when I do that, that becomes 290 out of 305, which 0 0.951 or 95.1%. It gets messy and, you know, it just depends on your learning style is can you do all this and locate everything without it labeled or if do you need to label it? I like to label it. I like to make it as clear as I can for myself. Okay, that's it. Video's over. Good luck on the test.